How's it going, everybody? Thanks for coming back after the break. Um, my name is Benjamin Silverstein. I'm with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, the new-ish space security program, space project, rather. Uh, we've got a really interesting uh, set of papers today from, from a bunch of uh, great authors. And it's really interesting to me, at least, to, to have a, a panel on space security at a space traffic management conference, which is those two crowds uh, traveling in not quite oil and vinegar, but at least different, uh, different pods of whales. But they're obviously very linked. Um, we've, got, we've got a bunch of issues uh, that without good space traffic management will become security issues, and a lot of security issues that are going to impact the way that we think about space traffic management. A lot of those issues are from uh, national perspectives, and a lot of them have impacts for international opportunities and uh, international collaboration. Um, so first up, uh, we're just going to jump right into this. We've got a couple people online. It looks like anybody's like there. Awesome. Perfect. All right. First up, we have... Uh, Dr. Sandeep Bhatt, who is a professor of law and the director at the Center for Aviation and Space Law at the National University of Judicial Sciences in Kolkata. His research focuses, uh, and I think this is really interesting, on space and medical law. And I'll let Dr. Bhatt take it away with his, uh, with his paper. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, I hope that actually I'm audible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So may I uh, share the screen? Just let me take a minute to do that. Uh, can someone confirm that whether the screen is visible? Yes. Fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, a very good evening to all of you from uh, India. It's always been a privilege for me to be part of uh, this conference. Uh, this has been the second time. Uh, last year also, actually, I presented on uh, uh, the Paros Treaty, the, pre the Prevention of Arms Race in Outer Space Treaty. Uh, probably actually when the last year I uh, discussed about the Paros Treaty, I was so optimistic and I was basically uh, speaking about the possibility of uh, the having such a kind of a comprehensive treaty maybe in the near future. But probably in the current scenario wherein uh, we need something to be done for the purpose of ensuring space security and also ensuring that the outer space would not be used for the military or some destructive purposes. Uh, we have to find a kind of a via media. And uh, today's, my today's presentation is primarily in terms of uh, what we can do in the existing treaty framework for the purpose of uh, redefining the use of force armed, armed attack as well as the weapons of mass destruction in the context of the space activities. Now, uh, as all of us are aware of, uh, the United States has already established its use uh, the space force. And there are many other countries who have also actually started uh, some units in their force, which would be focusing in terms of the military activities in uh, our space. The, uh, as the time has passed on, we are finding more and more kind of actually the military users, maybe even the cyber war warfare, uh, anti-satellite missile testings, uh, and even actually there are so many other kind of applications which have also been made in outer space. All these activities, in a way, maybe threatening our very future, uh, not just in outer space activities, but also on the Earth, especially in the current crisis scenario. We're all really worried about the possibility of escalation of the dispute in the outer space as well. So in light of this, let me just actually go back to the Outer Space Treaty 1967 and find out what is available within the ambit of OST 1967. Article 3 and Article 4 are the only two major provisions which come to my mind with respect to the space security or uh, peaceful uses of the outer space. Uh, Article 3, while it speaks about the application of uh, public international law as well as the Charter of the United Nations with respect to any activities in the, the outer space, uh, it's very clear that uh, the Charter's provisions with respect to prohibition on use of force as well as armed attack should definitely be applicable in the, uh, the outer space. But only problem is with respect to the current activities like maybe uh, the cyber attacks, which do not use any kind of the physical weapon for the purpose of uh, causing any damage. Uh, there is a question as to can we classify them as within the ambit of use of force as well as armed attack for the purpose of saying that there can be contra uh, contravention of other uh, UN charter. Now, Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty, which I discussed uh, quite in detail in the last uh, conference, I would, not, I would not like to touch upon the uh, areas which I discussed therein. 
I would like to focus only on one aspect of Article 4, which basically prohibits the nuclear weapons or any other kind of weapons of mass destruction uh, in the outer space, orbiting it in the outer space, or maybe uh, even actually uh, placing it in the outer space has been prohibited in Article 4. But what about the conventional weapons? Because it's very clear on nuclear weapons and any other kind of weapons of mass destruction. So one of the arguments is to allow the conventional weapons in the outer space. My argument is that even the conventional weapons need to be prohibited and probably we have to interpret that within the ambit of Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty itself. That is through the definition of the weapon of mass destruction. UNGA Resolution 37-87, 34-87A, uh, while defining the weapon of mass destruction, says that it's an auto, uh, atomic explosive weapons, radioactive material weapons, lethal chemical or biological weapons, and any weapons developed in the future which have the characteristics comparable in destructive effect. Unfortunately, over the period of time, we focus only on the initial portion. We have, we have focused more in terms of atomic explosive weapons or maybe radioactive materials, chemical as well as biological weapons, so on and so forth. But what we need to emphasize is the last part of the definition, especially from the outer space context. It speaks about weapons developed in the future, which have characteristics comparable in destructive effect. And I, my, in my paper, I'm primarily arguing for the requirement of an evolutionary interpre interpretation. Comparable rate of destructive effect has to be interpreted in the context of outer space. What has happened is that over the period of time, we have interpreted this particular phrase from our earthly experiences without actually considering that the context of outer space is entirely different from uh, our Earth. Even a small, maybe a debris in the outer space can have a catastrophic eff effect in uh, the space. So given that factor, we have to actually consider different weapons, not just the ones which we have understood on the Earth as the weapons of, weapons of mass destruction in the context of outer space. Similarly, I mentioned about Article 3, use of force and armed attack. We need to use the effect-based interpretation. What exactly is the effect of a particular act, especially when we speak about the cyber attacks or any other kind of other mechanism wherein there is no tangible objects for attacking the space assets, uh, we have to go by the effect-based interpretation to say that uh, there is use of force, there is armed attack within the uh, ambit of the, the UN Charter. Probably the developments have already started. I can quote the uh, Italian manual uh, 2.0 as well as the uh, Umera manual. Uh, both of them basically speak about actually the cyber attack and they have mentioned about they considering as a kind of a use of force or armed attack. Even with respect to AZAT testing also, I should say the same thing. Simply because the country is destroying its own satellite through the AZAT capability, it doesn't mean that actually there is a kind of a threat of force. There is definitely a threat of force contrary to the UN Charter. So to wind up, uh, let me quote from the judge, uh, Vladlin Versitin, who basically says that semantic methods cannot transform a military activity into a peaceful activity and vice versa. In any language, peaceful activity remains peaceful and military, military. So what we want in outer space is primarily the peaceful activities, not any kind of a military activity, either under the garb of actually say, uh, uh, not having any kind of a weapon or under the garb of defensive purposes or whatever other kind of actually the uh, pretext with the states have taken over the period of time. So my argument is that we have to go for an effect-based interpretation and we have to redefine different phrases used under Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty for its effectiveness to prevent the outer space from being a kind of a war zone. Thank you so much and I'll be really happy to answer the questions uh, in the course of time. Thank you, Professor. Next up, we have Dr. Rafal Krashik, who brings 15 years of engineering experience uh, on dependable hardware and software uh, to his research at the University of Luxembourg, which uh, focuses on architecture and methods for increasing resilience in outer space systems. Can you hear me well? No. Okay, great. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of uh, let's say computer science perspective on safety and security, uh, especially in, in context of space traffic management and, uh, and space debris. 
Um, so we, I think we can all agree that we are not very good at tackling environmental issues. And uh, we see this with greenhouse gases and we slowly start to see that with uh, space debris as well. And uh, well, I'm not that very optimistic if we, that we can solve the issues with, uh, with space debris before we get into the Kessler syndrome and, and so on. Sooner or later, this will happen and we can start acting sooner or later. Uh, mo most likely we will start acting later. But at some point we will have no other choice uh, than really start acting and removing the debris and uh, ensuring the, the access to, to space, to low Earth orbit and uh, well, near space. So on, at some point, humanity will have to deploy space debris cleaning program or operations on a mass scale. And me and uh, together with my friends, we were thinking, well, what kind of technology can help us doing this? And uh, after some kind of review, it's for us it, currently, it's clear that it's only the laser-based orbital debris removal is the technology that can be feasibly deployed on a mass scale. And uh, this can be ground or space-borne activity with the facilities deployed perhaps around the world or multiple orbits with laser light sources and adaptive mirrors for focusing on targets with pulsed laser operations of tens of hertz and kilojoules of energy in pulse, which will cause the ablation vaporization of the object surface. Hopefully it's gonna be uh, the, the debris surface. And in the end, uh, we will be able to manage to, to change, to alter the orbit of the, of the space debris in a way to lower its perigee and then let forces of nature act and do the job of deorbiting the stuff. So the point is that such laser broom or push a laser as it, call, as, as it is called in the literature, it can be highly effective against objects, um, but also if it is misused, it can be targeted against the operational equipment, weaponized. And this is a very serious dilemma, right? Because on one hand, we will have to do something on a mass scale. And on the other hand, we don't, have, we want, we don't want to have another weapons around uh, causing havoc or causing damage to, to um, assets that shouldn't be targeted. Um, I want to indicate that there are some technical means that can help us in ensuring the consensual control of su such kind of facilities. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's typically called uh, um, a Byzantine uh, fault tolerance. It's a, it's a method of distributing information and control among many independent stakeholders in a way that we can ensure system safety and security or fault and intrusion tolerance. And this phenomena is quite well known in computer science for the moment. Um, and typically it takes to, to cover one fault or intrusion inside the system in a synchronous setup it, uh, you need to have a four independent stakeholders in the system to safely operate such system. And if we deploy such system in cloud on a, on, a, on a massive scale for sharing some SSA data for the objects to be targeted and when they are supposed to be targeted by those laser facility and which laser facility, then uh, the decision can be done collectively by the majority of the stakeholders. And then such information can be sent to the facility. And then there's another level of the system, lower level, which uh, consists of the safety modules inside the facility, which are, let's say, ears and eyes and hands of the, of the stakeholders, which receive the messages from all the stakeholders um, and decide where to point and control whether the pointing of the facility is as agreed um, by, the, by the majority. Uh, and each of the safety module has a capability to turn or, or on, to turn on or off the kill switch, which is required to be turned on in order to provide power for the laser. And here for the kill switches, we need to all of the stakeholders to agree that for given operation, they allow this facility to be operated. So those kill switches, um, they provide extra safety feature, the veto mechanism. So let's say a unilateral way of um, stopping the, the facility operation. Mm, and this is very important because this allows to, uh, for the stakeholders not to share all of their SSA information with the other stakeholders because they might have some 
confidential or classified objects which might enter the cleaning zone and they do, do not want to disclose existence of such obje objects. So they just issue the, uh, the veto and they don't need to explain themselves for this. So in the paper, we, uh, we outline more detailed plans for building such distributed system, implementing those safety modules at lower level and cloud-based processing at higher level. Um, and technically speaking, we end up in, with means for collaborative control of such facilities, which could be used for cleaning space debris, but when misused, they are simply anti-satellite weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for outlining the thing. That's that was really interesting. I, I think that all the papers will be available online after this after the session. So looking forward to reading that. Next up, we have Rachan Rajas, who is a student at the Ramayana College of Law and has a, a, a paper on uh, AI in space. Uh, good morning. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. You're audible. Okay, great. Um, just give me a second. I'll be sharing my screen. Okay, um, so I'm going to begin. So um, greetings, distinguished guests. My name is Raksha Jesh. And um, I'm here to present my paper uh, that is based on the future of outer space, um, AI in outer space warfare and the role of international humanitarian law. So um, I wanted to start off by saying that the concept of outer space warfare seemed like an idea that would only be confined to our imagination, but um, reality is now painting another image. So um, it's, so what I'm trying to say is that it's, uh, since we're, we're, since it's, drastically changing, it's imperative that um, we also amend laws that could reduce conflicts that could happen in um, outer space. So it's imperative to amend the existing laws to prevent any legal loopholes which can potentially be exploited by nations. And um, these potential conflicts could, you know, really uh, create um, an outer space warfare or risk that could potentially happen. So, but as of 2022, no genuine space wars have been documented, but um, a handful of testing and demonstrations have, um, taken, have taken place. So um, space exploration has progressed significantly since the 1960s and um, is no longer about the Apollo era, which was between the Soviet Union and US. It's no longer just about space exploration. We now have different kinds of players in space. We have um, other superpowers like China, Japan, um, and, and even India exploring space as of now. And as the number of spacefaring states increases, um, the technology and the operational capabilities improve. So space plays a, a very vital part in um, national security. So at the same time, uh, space mining becomes increasingly possible. So, um, the ge so what we can understand from here is that the geopolitical environment has shifted um, dramatically. And, um, and it's, as I said, it's no longer about um, the Apollo era that we were once in, but rather it's the focus is more on economic benefits, like producing unique goods, extracting rare components from outer space. Uh, for instance, a small asteroid, um, uh, which is like 200 meters long and could be rich in platinum, could be worth over 30 billion. Um, so um, this is just one aspect of outer space, but but that being said, national security is still one of the prevalent focuses of, um, of outer space. So the presence of satellites in the orbit is critical to most of the world's communication systems. And spacefaring nations today are at the top of their game, and exploiting space would be the best defense mechanism against adversaries. So um, unlike the yesteryear between the Cold War foes, this new battle pit it's um, a bevy of private actors against one another. And we can call these private actors um, or as non-state actors. Basically, they're not affiliated to any nation per se. So um, outer space is becoming increasingly accessible and, comparative, and uh, a very feasible domain to operate in as well. 
So a growing number of, um, of state and non-state actors are operating throughout our outer space. And um, we also have um, space-based and ground-based interference with space systems that um, disrupt crucial space supported services and applications which are used by millions of people. So the increased participation of um, NSAs in space activities raises particular concerns, like um, especially the threat of inter intentional interference with space systems by nefarious actors like terrorist organizations. For instance, we had um, the LTTE who uh, was able to jam um, the 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 satellite signals for over two years, which was uh, which was which was problematic when we uh, think about it. And AI in outer space. So now coming to the AI part of my paper of our paper, uh, AI in outer space is undergoing a rapid development towards non-human um, analysis, decision making, and application of action. So the evolving utilization of intelligent space objects presents a new challenge to the current space law regime, um, especially when the use of such objects may cause um, extraterrestrial injury by an AI system or service such as violation of the right of privacy, data protection requirement, or injury resulting from um, a collision involving a space object. So space assets uh, face both natural and man-made dangerous. So natural dangerous satellites can be classified as natural orbital, debris, solar activity, and so forth. But man-made threats can either be unintentional or they could be intentional, that is cyberspace attacks or ASAT weapons. So now um, the other section um, um, that we talk about is the weaponization of outer space. So um, now that space is being used for military purpose, um, we have, uh, we currently do have um, uh, uh, countries like, for instance, in from 2017, um, the United States has been ha training a red team to protect, to have like simulated attacks on their satellite. So um, all of that is happening just for on uh, like on a national security forefront that they're training their army to make sure that um, they're prepared in case an actual conflict actually happens. So um, let's look at the types of weapons in outer space. So in January 2007, we have China, and they carried out an anti-satellite destruction test using an anti-satellite weapon, ASAT. And this triggered the perspective of outer space as a warfighting domain in the post-Cold War era. So China needed to build um, asymmetric capabilities in space and cyberspace as a response to uh, an unexpected contingency in the Taiwan Strait. So this test created a large amount of space debris and was met with a lot of criticism. So um, also though space was used as a military purpose for several years during the Cold War. Um, the, uh, the Cold War foes during that time refrained from these kinds of tests because of the careless physical attacks that could have impact in the operations of space. But since China was, per was pursuing a strategy of asymmetric warfare, they forced uh, players, the major players in space to recognize the vulnerability of space system. So, um, and another type of weapon is soft kill weapons. And soft kill weapons are inclusive of, uh, uh, they basically are designed to dis disable the functionality of a satellite instead of destroying it. And um, this also poses uh, an, Im uh, an Im imminent threat um, in general. So, um, so, so these are just some of the, uh, the types of weapons that are involved in space and some of the risks that are involved. And uh, while we also have the Outer Space Treaty, it does not offer uh, a detailed insight on peaceful purposes. Um, essentially, the treaty assures freedom of exploration and use of space to all humankind, but there are multiple gaps within this treaty. So um, a major issue arises from the fact that the treaty does not offer clear definitions for either peaceful purposes or uh, due regard. So, uh, so while the Outer Space Treaty does specifically prohibit placing nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction anywhere in space, it does not prohibit the use of conventional weapons um, in space. So um, our, our paper looks at the loopholes of the existing legislations that are currently um, are there in um, international law. And we also examine um, international humanitarian law. So though international humanitarian law is applicable in space, um, it's, uh, we believe that it's not enough for, um, 
uh, to prevent uh, an actual conflict from happening. And um, on top of that, we also offer uh, two mechanisms um, to prevent a conflict from happening. And this would be one um, ADR, alternative dispute resolution that could be uh, framed in space for a uh, major countries because we believe that it's not just nations that are involved anymore. There are also, uh, we also have commercial actors, non-state uh, non actors as well. So, um, in, uh, so an ADR would, would be um, a, 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 a better way to resolve this type of dispute. And um, then we also say that um, an actual framework must be legislated under um, the UNUSA, UNUSA guidelines. So um, I hope I was able to summarize my uh, uh, paper and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Raksha. And now we've got next to you, Ana Carrasco Sohias, who's an undergraduate in the Elliott School at George Washington University. Uh, majoring in international affairs. Yes, right. Okay. Um, so the previous panelists they talk about what are the guidelines and the importance of guidelines and best practices uh, for space. And so in this sense, I saw a need for clarifying the existing law. And so I decided to research about the legitimacy of military targeting dual use space systems under just in bill to suggest that uh, policymakers could employ international law as an international space normative infrastructure to manage the existence and use of weapons and ensure the sustainability, stability, and peaceful use of outer space. So um, the first conspicuous gap that I found of the existing coverage of international law was, was the problem of discrimination. Um, discrimination is essential uh, to prevent uh, and mitigate suffering. And so uh, when it comes to dual use space technology, it is pretty hard. Um, so what the law says is, um, states or um, commercial actors, they need to um, try to distinguish uh, in a feasible manner, but that's kind of a dilemma. And so um, the attacker in this sense cannot assume that um, a non-structure is gonna be civilian or just military use. And in this sense, I came with several scenarios to show, uh, try to clarify um, this aspect. For example, one of them would be a uh, hosted payload where a civilian satellite bus transports also uh, and sustains a uh, variety of payloads, including some military ones. And so in this sense, um, it will be legitimate the, to target the military uh, parts if um, they are being used, but again, uh, it's hard to, um, to even imagine if it's attainable because uh, I don't think we do have the cyber capabilities to just distinguish um, the uh, proportionally cost that that will make with uh, debris and other uh, useful and consequences will just be uh, not proportionally at all. Another scenario will be uh, whether that satellite is being used uh, for sequential or simultaneous use as well as if it's pervasive or not. Because if it's consistent, yes, states could recognize uh, it is being used as a military, um, for the military and therefore uh, it is uh, subject to the target. However, if it's uh, inconsistent, intermittent, uh, it makes um, places a sensitive burden for the other state um, Obviously, the other state will need to um, have the intelligence or specific data to point out that that specific state, uh, space asset is being used for a uh, military target. But again, uh, it's hard to make that distinction, which uh, on the other side, on the right side, uh, it could be a potential deterrent for states to just target uh, dual use uh, technology. However, um, looking at the US Air Force uh, doctrine, they said uh, already determined that uh, 
the converse scenario. Um, for example, if China was to use the European Union's Galileo uh, positioning systems satellites, uh, if used it in a military way, it could be like a legitimate target. So it's hard to make that distinction. And again, uh, if the states, for example, obscure um, that they are using that uh, space asset, that could be also or disable them, consider uh, an act of perfidy, and therefore it will be in violation of mens rea. Uh, another issue that I found was uh, regarding ownership and neutrality. So, for example, um, several um, space countries, uh, they have tried to integrate uh, their assets with foreign-owned uh, operated satellites into a joint national security architecture. And the problem here is for example, if one country was to use it in a military way, but then the other countries didn't want to do that, then how, uh, as an attacker, how do you distinguish that? Should you target, should you deprive uh, only the US, for example? Because if you do that, you're gonna deprive the US and say it's allies. So then it creates just like so many um, consequential, um, unsurmountable, disproportionately consequences that is uh, even hard to argue that one. And when in doubt, I found out that it should be presumed that the object is civilian nature. Um, and I think, uh, again, in this past point, uh, the, some reason why the states may do this is because they want to overwhelm the other states uh, with as, more, uh, as many possible targets as possible and so that they are fully deterred from uh, legitimately targeting just like those space assets. Um, military necessity was another difficult um, point to assess. Um, in this sense, I found out that establishing a higher standard for military necessity should be a uh, priority and the guideline for best practices for states. And in this sense, uh, I made an analogy with uh, the UNESCO and how uh, satellites could be framed as objects that reflect humanity's space, cultural and historical heritage. And so uh, it could be implemented uh, a same regulation as uh, they do in war when uh, there are museums or historical places. And another issue was that um, this definition does not delimitate attacks and overlooks acts of convenience. For example, the temporary loss of functionality of an object mm -hmm. without physically damaging it, would that be um, military needed or not? Um, then the last one, the proportionality. Wherefore, we all know uh, it is not an exact science, but it's even more inaccurate in space. And in this context, the increasing congestion, diversification with most uh, stakeholders and the debris problem uh, further complicate the proportionality calculus and uh, also the increasing dependency of modern societies on satellites. Uh, they make it really hard um, to argue that it would be proportional to target any of the dual use space systems just because of the uh, consequential uh, acts that they will have and the devastating effects on life on Earth. And finally, so what are the implications of this analysis um, in outer space and the evolution of a, for a sound? a uh, legal regime regulating dual space uh, targeting. Well, I have uh, four potential solutions. I know some of them may be unsuitable or a little um, controversial, but I think of them as food for thought and starting a uh, debate. So the first one will be as they did in other domains, like air, sea, and land. And so they try to separate. Uh, so in this sense, it will mean 
again, separating uh, sex workers to the sector from the government. However, I don't think that would be good for the space industry. I think that would be a weakness, but it could be a potential for solution at least for uh, the solving the discrimination issue and they're just in bello. Another would be the opposite. So it would be perhaps the countries arguing that it is not economically feasible, it will weaken the space industry, and therefore um, trying to modify the principle of extension for outer space. And the last one, which I think is the more reasonable one, uh, is uh, finding a consensus, um, just deciding uh, whether to all space objects during war will be either civilian or military. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, we've, we've hit on a bunch of uh, really, really big topics. We've got deterrence, we've got consent, we've got existing international law, and we've got potential, uh, the, the ways that potential new technologies impact international law now in the future. Um, so I guess we'll open it up to questions now. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, Take Mariba up on his uh, his suggestion that we we push back and, and have a, a lively debate on some of the issues that are brought up here. I specifically wanted to address uh, the contention that lasers are somehow going to be ready and useful for uh, debris remediation. Um, one problem is that yes, certainly we can we can use laser ranging. The ILRS has demonstrated that on a daily basis, but it's one thing to hit a space object with with some photons and get a few photons in return to understand the range and range rate. It's yet another thing to be able to actually do anything useful in that regard as far as moving it. Uh, Mariba and I have both been involved with the Space Environment Research Center in, in Canberra, um, who are actually trying to demonstrate for the first time ever, as far as we know, that they're going to try to move and measure the movement of a slight piece of space debris. So no one's done it. Um, space Trying to hit things in space with lasers is hard, as we know from uh, things that have gone on at the Starfire Optical Range and at, at Maui. It's not easy. Um, and the other thing is that there have been a number of studies that have shown that it's not the small things that you want to move or mediate, it's the large things because they are the sources of the small things. The small things have higher energy mass ratios, are soon washed out, and, and aren't necessarily the problem for the space environment in the long run. Lasers are unlikely to have a big effect on multi-ton defunct rocket bodies and such. Um, whereas, you know, those are the objects that you want to remediate, the ones that are in clusters. So IAF has done studies on that, international studies, Aerospace Corporation has done studies, NASA has done studies with DARPA. Um, and so anything that you can move with a laser is probably not useful in that regard. So uh, I'll throw that out for some more debate. That's a lot to respond to if you'd like to take a crack at it. Um, yeah, well, you are totally right. I mean, this hasn't been uh, experimented, but uh, imagine uh, turning the laser broom into the laser weapon, laser saber. I think it really sparks the imagination here, and it's um, easier to think about it as a way of turning tool into the weapon, you know, like the, the type of the dilemma that we are trying to address here. And the point is that the, the system that we are describing in the paper, like the computer science view on making things safe and secure, as, as, as for now, is applicable to all, let's say, techniques that we could think of, including, you know, attaching the, the electrodynamic tether, uh, grabbing an object and then deorbiting using propulsion. It's, it's a generic thing, but I think thinking about space, well, laser sabers, you know, like affecting the objects out there in space uh, is uh, it's easier to, you know, like the show that the problem might be there in terms of weaponization of the tools. And just to, to briefly piggyback off that, you, you mentioned a couple of other types of technologies. Um, are there, did, did you apply this paradigm to those technologies in, in your paper or, or in your analysis and see how far they work? Um, 
sorry, muting. Well, the solution is generic, right? Because it's just deciding on what has to be deorbited, when, and by what kind of uh, um, tool or device or facility. And the point is that it has to be, it cannot be done by a single stakeholder because then it can go malicious or it can, let's say, fall a prey to a fault and uh, do things which are considered an attack instead of cleaning up stuff. So technology is definitely generic. Uh, we thought that, uh, well, visibility studies of the laser technology has been done. Um, it's interesting. It's, uh, let's say, um, good motivation to, to think about uh, how to operate such facilities in a safe and secure manner. So to stay on the same train with the lasers, uh, how big does the space object need to be in order to be accurately hit by laser technologies? Also, how accurate are these lasers? So I, in the paper, we are referring to a bunch of studies by, by Pips et al. Uh, they've uh, had, they had a few papers uh, in Acta Astronautica, and they started really with checking the feasibility of uh, the orbiting uh, NVSAT down to uh, some small debris of uh, submeter size. And the studies were, were quite positive in this, in this regard. And then we had one other question online that was, what is the line of destruction or effects that would make something come to the level of mass destruction in space, short of nuclear weapons, as the speaker is suggesting? Uh, I think it's the question directed to me. So yeah, uh, let me just answer that. Uh, probably actually what I was basically uh, trying to say is uh, something which we have evidenced on Earth as well. Because even on the Earth, we don't have any standard for the purpose of saying that what is a weapon of mass destruction, right? So despite we say that actually, uh, maybe say uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons, or maybe any other kind of weapons which may have the equal amount of uh, effect, we don't have any standard on the earth and it has to be decided on case by case basis whether a particular kind of a weapon would qualify as a weapon of mass destruction or not. Uh, I think a related question I also saw in the chat box uh, with respect to the DLOs uh, of the say basketball, uh, sorry, the, uh, the baseball bat or maybe any other kind of a thing in the outer space, which might also have a equal amount of the effect in the outer space when they have been used for some offensive purposes. Uh, maybe that actually uh, we, of course, if we go by the traditional notion, we might not be able to consider this as either as a weapon of mass destruction or maybe as a kind of an armed attack or use of force as we understand under the chart of the United Nations. But I should say that uh, it might not qualify the test of weapon of mass destruction, but at least actually it should qualify the test of uh, a use of force or maybe even armed attack whenever actually some kind of an attack is uh, done with the help of, uh, I mean, anything, maybe a sports uh, equipment, whatever has been mentioned in the, the chat box. I should say that it should at least qualify the test of uh, use of force or maybe armed attack contrary to the chart of the United Nations. Is uh, cyber warfare considered a weapon, for instance, if we jam a satellite, um, if the DOD jams another satellite, that be considered a weapon, uh, another military satellite? Or could it be described as a weapon? Uh, I couldn't hear. Is it a question addressed to me? Can anyone just sum it up? Can you hear, Can you hear my voice? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, please. You want to just ask me again? Is a cyber warfare, for instance, if uh, a military uh, country takes out another satellite through um, cyber means, can that be described as a weapon? If you if you jam another satellite, is it or is it not? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear you definitely. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, if anyone else actually can tell it, that would be very great, I suppose. 
Is it actually jamming? You are asking about jamming uh, the, the satellite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that is jamming? Is jamming the satellite considered a weapon? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, I should say that yes, it should be, uh, especially uh, in light of the modern uh, cyber warfare technology. Uh, whenever actually it has got a severe effect on the other uh, uh, space capability or maybe anything related to the space capability, I should say that it should qualify as a kind of a weapon. All right. So to, to tie it back a little bit to, to some of the topics that, that we've heard already today, um, and thinking about the commercial sector's role in all of this, um, and, and specifically thinking about this, uh, potential self-regulation or, or commercial first regulation, uh, commercial sponsored regulation or best practices or guidelines or whatever you want to use for that. What types of things do you do, uh, do you think commercial sectors do in the context of your, your pieces? Uh, to, to ensure stability and security in the space. And, and we'll, we'll start in reverse order uh, with our first. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so I think, particularly, just uh, to hear the trading between uh, the use and also the behavior. So it means, for example, if you are approaching another country's satellite or another uh, company's satellite, just trying to say, as we do with social distancing, keep precautions and just uh, try to be overly precautious because otherwise uh, there's a lot of room because of the lack of clarification under international law. Uh, there's a lot of behaviors that can be uh, caught as aggressive um, that can increase the fog of war and therefore, um, I think precaution is uh, what uh, the commercial um, sector should do. Does that sense? Uh, and Raksha, for, for commercial actors who might want to incorporate uh, AI concepts into their into their offerings with the and satellite objects, what what types of um, what types of rules do you, do you think are right for the commercial sector to adopt here for self regulation purposes? Am I audible? Yep, we got you. Okay. Um, so, um, so basically, I just want to start off by saying that, um, that the world has entered, as I said earlier, the world is in a new phase of the space age. So, um, so NSAs um, in particular, um, I have not been anticipated during the formulation of key space treaties, which are now part of international space law or the ISL regime. So the Outer Space Treaty establishes the basis of the ISL framework. So instances such as the risk of accidents between satellites and space trash is increasing, necessitating, necessitating the adoption of new space rules. So um, Heather S. Fogel in the Yearbook for Canadian International Law questions whether it's, whether it's state's responsibility to bear the costs or the liabilities for the acts of NSAs with a nexus to per, for those states. So for instance, if Google is um, Google is based in the United States, so would the United States be responsible for Google's actions? So that's just an example. So it's easy to assume that one or more normative legal regimes would apply at the first look. And um, basically what we would need is that we would need an international space law, international telecommunications law, and the, uh, and the law of, of, of state responsibility to make sure that um, these uh, these commercial players are responsible. So we can absolutely uh, see a link between international humanitarian law to the greater benefit of mankind at the moment, but there is a growing need to construct a law that oversees the commercial space industry um, as a whole. I, um, I hope I was able to answer that question. Thank you, and going down the line, Dr. Gosh. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Could you just rephrase it um, a little bit? Absolutely. Are, are there any uh, emerging or, or potential uh, nascent self-governance principles that the commercial industry could adopt uh, in the context of, of your early analysis? Mm, okay. I think there's an issue with your mic, <laughs> but uh, let me mm, let me a little bit uh, let me answer in let's say uh, respect to what I understand here. Um, 
I, I think w one of the big problems uh, we are facing here with safety and security of space, from my perspective, which uh, which is coming from the safety and security of the system, computer systems in general, is that we are having a single sources of information, any type of information like the, the situational awareness, the ephemeris uh, about what is happening out there, and why why do we trust it? Like when we download the TLEs from Celestrack, there is no reason really to trust what we get. How do you know that you are not a falling prey to men in the middle attack. There's no way of checking this, knowing this basically, um, until you have some other source of information and you cross validate them. And then you can start making these decisions. You know, this is what I see as the biggest problem. We are trying to make decisions or um, let's say, uh, come to a conclusions with uh, data that we're gonna trust. And that's the biggest threat right now, I think. Yeah, there are a couple questions in the chat, a couple of words. Okay, this one's from uh, Luke. He said, this is a question for any panelist. How do you conceptualize risk posed on space assets versus risk po po poised to the orbitable environment itself? That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, is this a question that the uh, risk to the space assets vis a vis the space environment as such? Is that the question which has been asked? I think the, the I, I don't have a question in front of me, but the question was about uh, comparing and, and the way that you understand uh, risks to satellites themselves and risks to the environmental, uh, the overall environment as a finite resource. Okay, so if I have understood the question properly, let me just uh, try to address it. So I believe that actually it's a risk to the space asset vis-a-vis the risk to the environment as a whole, the, maybe the space environment as a whole, actually. That is what I've basically been asked for. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, yes. Um, um, if, I mean, if I have to say from my perspective and also in my major of the different articles, actually, I have argued that uh, if we assume that a uh, risk to the space asset is actually 10%, maybe because of all these kind of uh, uh, activities, the military activities, or maybe uh, increased space uh, uh, activities, or so on and so forth, I should say that actually, at least to the risk, risk to the space environment, at least actually should stand at 50%. So it's, uh, so it's uh, more than double the risk, whatever actually is going to be faced with respect to the space asset, uh, sim simply because of the reason that with the increased uh, uh, destructions in the space or maybe they increase the explosions we are going to create more and more debris and already nasa has uh, given us the picture of actually what would be the possibilities in the future if at all there is a growing uh, debris resulting in so much of cascading effect and uh, to my understanding the if we look from the point of view of the law article 9 of the outer space treaty is very very weak in preventing this because article 9 of the outer space treaty speaks about only the prevention of harmful contamination of the outer space and adverse changes in the earth environment. So in a way, it is more oriented towards protection of the earth environment rather than actually the outer space environment, so which is a real disaster. Probably if we have to ensure that the space security is there and environment is protected, we need to have a better provision than Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty to protect the outer space environment. Hope that answers the question, if I have understood the question properly. Thank you for taking this time. We've got one last comment or question in the audience, and then uh, I think it's time for a break. Yeah, so this is a question for Raksha. Uh, it was a, based on a comment that Diane made before she had to go off the meeting. Um, but the question was this. So given that Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty requires the continual oversight and supervision of uh, nationals by states, um, we're kind of wondering what do we mean by a non-state actor? I mean, I think we would agree that uh, ESA in an international intergovernmental organization is not a non-state actor. Are we talking about like the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda or what do you actually mean by a non-state actor given the framework of the, of the uh, outer space treaty? Thank you. Raksha, I think you have the last word. Thank you.
<laughs> all right, thanks everybody for your participation and, and a big thanks to all of the presenters. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading the papers and I hope you all are too. Thanks.